Chapter 20 The following morning, the three of us were up early. Crockett was scrambling eggs and frying bacon while Brooks and I packed the mining gear and filled the canteens. We'd stayed up much of that night discussing what had happened. I told them what Charlie said to me. Brooks suggested we split. Crockett said no. I ain't going any place. We got our work here, and I'll be damned if we're going to be run off. Our success with Charlie during that initial encounter was due to several factors. For one thing, Crockett anticipated Charlie would use fear tactics to influence us. Though I knew nothing about the Tate LaBianca murders, which was also in our favor, I had experienced Charlie's fear games before. Two, Crockett had been prepared for Charlie by Brooks and me. We'd been spouting his rap for months, so that nothing he said was new to Crockett. Crockett's validity, meanwhile, had been established in Charlie's mind by the mere fact that Brooks, Juanita, Bo, Stephanie, and I had defected. Equally disturbing, perhaps, in my light of my claim of a psychic barrier on the canyon was Charlie's inability to get his trucks and supplies up to the ranch. Charlie knew about psychic power to realize that such phenomena was possible, and after meeting Crockett, however briefly, it became clear to him that the old miner was for real. In a single afternoon, the stage was set for what was to become a battle of nerves. The month that followed was both bizarre and frightening. While we ate that morning, Crockett reiterated what he'd said the night before. The idea is not to take anything from Charlie. Not even Snake, Paul. We don't need to make any agreements with him. We have all we need right here. A mine to dig, a good garden, plenty to keep us busy. We put our attention on what we have. Brooks and I both sensed that Crockett was intrigued by Charlie, and that part of his motivation to stay was prompted by his own curiosity. Crockett loved games. When Brooks asked him what he thought about Charles Manson, Crockett replied succinctly, He has a lot of power. We'd no more than stepped out the door when Snake appeared at the gate and motioned to me. Dressed in skin-tight Levi's and a transparent silk halter top, she stood leaning against the fence post. Charlie wasn't wasting any time. While I spoke with Snake, Crockett and Brooks started down the wash. She asked what I was doing, and I told her we had work to do. Charlie wants you to come up and make some music. He brought tapes of the stuff we recorded at Spawn's. Maybe later. Charlie knew my greatest tie to the family was the music. A lot of the work was mine. He also knew how tight I was with Snake. She asked if I was coming back with the family. I said no and started down the wash after Brooks and Crockett. I'll come back later, Paul. She called after me. It was around nine o'clock and already hot. The sides of the wash loomed up on either side of me as I scrambled over the boulders, then descended to the creek bed. I spotted Brooks and Paul far down the wash, Crockett in front wearing a red bandana tied around his neck and Brooks just behind him. I could see the tire tracks from Charlie's dune buggies in the sand, and yellow paint on an outcropping of rock where the vehicles had scraped the canyon walls. I thought about Snake and decided then that I would make love with her. What I had going with her, in my mind, had nothing to do with Charlie. Submitting to any of the other girls would be different, 
like taking of Charlie's hospitality. But with Snake, I had established a separate relationship. That night, when we got back to Barker's, she was there. The die was horny. I knew Charlie had sent her, but it didn't matter. I took her up to the bunkhouse, and we made love. Later, when Crockett asked me what had happened, I told him. He shook his head. You're a fool, he muttered. Maybe so, but I feel a lot better. Around 11 the next morning, Stanley Barry pulled into the yard whoops, and parked his pickup. Brooks was on the porch. I heard him call out to Stanley. Stanley's here, and I shouted to Crockett. Crockett came out of the bathroom as Stanley entered the house, handing me a letter as he did so. Letter sent to Bob's post office in Vegas. Stanley poured himself a cup of coffee and sat down at the table. He was the second oldest of the Barry brothers and by far the most erasable. He had crew cut black hair, a chubby face, and walked with a portly, disoriented penguin. He wore a rancid, sweat-stained felt hat, which he took off and set on the table. 130 in Ballarat at 8 this morning, he said, more to himself than to any of us. Gotta go to L.A., I announced. Induction physical. Shit. Finally gonna do something for your country, are you? Stanley jibed. Instead of hanging around with this no-good rock hound. Crockett sat down with a cup of coffee and took out his cards. How are Bob and Juanita getting along? He asked. Got married Sunday. No, Saturday. And left the state. Stanley slurped at his coffee. No great loss as a minor. Bob was worth two tits on a boar. He set his cup down. What's all to do up at Myers? I seen two spanking new doom buggies sitting out front. Seen a couple of guys down in the wash too driving motorcycles. Said they was headed up here. More supplies for Charlie. And I said, looking at Brooks, probably Bill Vance. Well, Stanley said, getting to his feet. I gotta stop at Myers and pick up some of my tools. Then I'm heading back to Vegas. Anyone want a ride? Yeah, I'll ride with you. Then hitchhike to L.A. and make that physical by Monday. Crockett glanced up from his cards. Good idea. Yeah, you might get lucky, Stanley choked. Get drafted. Go to V9. Would you draft him? Crockett asked dryly. Either one of them. Stanley looked at me, then Brooks. Yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> I smiled and flipped Crockett off. Stanley grinned. Hey, little Paul, that reminds me. You know what a taint is, don't you? Think he's old enough to hear this, Big Paul? You know, Brooks? Nope. What's a taint? You know, the little space in there between the pussy and the asshole? He paused, his eyes dancing from me to Brooks. Well, taint pussy and taint asshole. Stanley's laugh sounded like a flock of startled poultry. I ripped off a booming fart. Let's go, I said. On our way out, we stopped at the Myers Ranch so Stanley could pick up his tools. Clam and Bruce were sitting outside with Brenda and Sandy. The dune buggies were pulled right up to the house. Boxes of supplies lay strewn along the narrow porch. Charlie appeared on the porch with Squeaky and Stanley, and I got out of the truck. He was all smiles. 
He told Stanley that he was welcome to any tools or equipment he saw lying around. Stanley thought that right neighborly and immediately loaded his truck with backpacks, picks, and shovels that Charlie had brought up from spawns. It was obvious to me that Stanley's eagerness to actually take the stuff pissed Charlie off. That was Charlie's way with people. Offer them everything so as to immediately put them in his debt. Usually the offer was enough. The first day I met Charlie, he offered me food, shelter, a harem of women, his entire lifestyle, asking only that in exchange, I cease to exist. A fate that could well have become Stanley's had he ever returned to the Myers Ranch while Charlie was there, which he didn't. Several days later, Charlie would tell Crockett, when Stanley comes back up here, I'm gonna bury him. We considered it part of Charlie's ongoing fear games, not knowing that by then he'd been responsible for at least eight murders. I attended my physical in L.A. on a Monday morning and before noon was classified as unfit for military service. A th a well-thought-out spiel on the virtues of drugs in expanding consciousness, plus my police record, was enough, apparently, to make me undesirable. That afternoon, I hitchhiked up to Spawns to find Juan, only to learn that he had left for Golar Canyon. In the meantime, Brenda had returned to Spawns to deliver a message to Clem and Gypsy, Charlie wanted them to come to Myers Ranch at once and to bring a load of motor parts. Brenda hailed me as I approached the, the boardwalk and I walked down to the corral where she and Clem were sitting on the chassis of a dune buggy smoking a joint. Brenda informed me they were driving back to the desert later that afternoon and that I was welcome to ride with them. I thanked her and told her I would. She asked why I hadn't come back to the family, saying that Charlie was hurt by me and that I was needed. By then, Brenda had become one of Charlie's heaviest and most dependable girls. She could talk his rap and get things done. And in contrast to some of the others, she never appeared spaced out or lethargic. Yet, Charlie had a firm hold on her. Like everyone else, she had been ordered to work on me. Clem, on the other hand, was totally blitzed and sat slouched over the steering wheel of the dune buggy, his eyes glassy, his hair matted and snarled. He wore buckskins and a hunting knife on his belt. He appeared stiff, almost cadaverous, as though the ends essence of what was once Steve Grogan had been drained out of his body and replaced by a recording that mumbled bits and snatches about Helter Skelter and the piggies and how beautiful it would all be when the young love came to the desert. Later, on the ride back to the desert, he became animated. He was driving while Brenda sat between us. Hey, he said. Heard about Shorty, huh? I didn't reply. I just looked straight ahead over the tops of boulders fronting on the horizon and beyond them to the mountains, which were cast in crimson as if a fire were burning somewhere beneath my vision. I did not want to believe what Clem was saying, but I knew it was true. And he didn't stop talking. Yeah. It was a trip, you know. I'd never seen so much blood. It was all over everything. But he wouldn't die. He just wouldn't die. He kept saying, Why, Charlie? Why? Why, Steve? Why? And we just kept stabbing him. Me, and Bruce, and Tex, and Charlie. You know why, motherfucker? Charlie says. 
but he wouldn't shut up. So when Charlie told me, I took the machete and chopped his head off so he stopped talking. And it just rolled off the trail. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Into the weeds. And I didn't tell Brooks and Crockett what Clement said. I justified it by trying to convince myself it wasn't true. That it wouldn't be a weakness. I wanted to be strong and not tell them. Yet, deep down, in the truest part of myself, which was only then becoming partially accessible, I knew it was true. That everything I had been committed to in the family had turned foul, irrevocably malignant. Juan spent two days at the Myers place with Charlie and the family, then moved into the Barker ranch with us. He said very little, but I sensed he knew a lot. Meanwhile, more supplies arrived for Charlie. Stolen doom buggies, Harleys, weapons, food supplies. Helter Skelter was in full swing, happening just as Charlie had described. There was still a part of me, even then, the thought maybe he was right. Brooks and Juan expressed similar feelings, yet we all recoiled at the reality of what the family had become. It is not easy to see people you love become subverted, twisted, rendered into robots. Crockett became our island of sanity. Something solid, like the mountains we could turn to and feel assured. Crockett had agreed to this position, consciously pitted himself against Charlie. Juan's defection became Crockett's victory. But the battle was only beginning. Juan's decision to join us wasn't made until he had taken off for a week with a canteen and some dried figs and hiked into Butte Valley to be alone. Juan Flynn was a deeply sensitive man, by nature happy and thoroughly outgoing. During the course of our friendship, I saw evidence of his compassion and generosity. His experience in the United States, after coming from Panama, had been no picnic. Immediately upon arrival, he was drafted into the army and sent into combat in Vietnam. He later confessed to all of us that his battlefield experiences were terrifying and that only by smoking hashish could he keep away from being totally paranoid. I was scared, he admitted. Sometime I think I will die and that it would be better to die than to be so frightened. That I just have to fight and fight and kill anyone who might kill me. In war, every man become a child who want his mother. Because there is so much he will never understand alone. It was not hard to comprehend how Charlie's rap on making love and facing your fears had appealed to Juan, particularly in light of his infatuation with Brenda. Charlie continued to use her, as he did Snake as a means of luring us back to the fold. With each new day, the scene became more nerve-wracking, like two armed camps in the throes of some bizarre and arcane psychological warfare. At odd hours during the day, Charlie would send down contingents of women, Snake, Weesh, Brenda, Sandy, and Squeaky, to work on us all. When that failed, he'd come into the yard with Clem and Tex, brandishing shotguns, and start shooting them off around the property. We learned to size up a situation and turn it around without panic. On one occasion, Crockett borrowed Clem's shotgun and began taking target practice in the front yard. Often, Charlie would engage Crockett in verbal exchanges, which sometimes lasted hours. But Crockett played it perfect. He did not fight with Charlie or openly disagree in a way that might provoke anger. He merely expressed opinions which left Charlie utterly flabbergasted.
He later confessed that he and Charlie shared many of the same opinions about the world, but that Charlie had a hole in his humanity. One evening, they were out in the yard near the porch, squatting on their haunches like two Indians taking a shit. Brooks and I were inside, listening through the window. Charlie was discussing karma, how every man and every spirit had a destiny that is inevitable. He insisted that part of his destiny was to bring about the revolution through Helter Skelter. As usual, he did most of the talking. Finally, after a long silence, Charlie asked Crockett, Look, do you always keep your head like that? Crockett seemed to ponder several moments, then said, If you were beating me with a stick, Charlie, don't you suppose I'd know it? Dig it. Why don't you teach me? How about that? You teach me. Teach you what? What you know. I can't teach you. You already know everything. We watched through the window as Charlie got to his feet and stretched, then knelt down again beside Crockett. Nah, he said. I don't know nothing. Really. I don't. Well, that's about the same as knowing everything. Can't teach a man who knows nothing. May nothing to build on. Charlie just couldn't get a handle on Crockett. He couldn't get any agreements with him, nor could he get any disagreements. Their exchanges served only to exasperate him, yet he would not give up. The dynamics of the situation were curious. Charlie wanted to be back in the family. He perhaps knew better than I how deeply I had been affected, and that only Crockett stood in his way. Crockett was the first guy Charlie had encountered who, Charlie believed, had more knowledge than he did. The rules of warfare were different because of it. He couldn't just kill Crockett. It would prove only that Charlie had been defeated. Rather, he had to psych him out, discredit him, con him. Getting us back into the family would accomplish all three objectives. But up until that point, it had gone all against Charlie. Not only had Juan Flynn joined forces with the crockett poston Watkins contingent, but there were others who were contemplating similar maneuvers. If the murders were weighing on Charlie's mind at the time, certainly he was aware of the hysteria they must have created that the man would seek a just revenge. It didn't manifest itself physically in his outward behavior. Such was not the case with many of the others. Within a matter of weeks, nearly everyone broke out in hideous open sores on their arms and legs. Sores that would not heal. Chapter 21 In late August, while Charlie's doom buggies roared across the Panamint Valley, police in L.A. sought leads in the Tate-LaBianca killings. Roman Polanski offered $25,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the Cielo Drive slaughter. Meanwhile, motives of the Tate and LaBianca murders were being postulated by police, detectives, newscasters, and Hollywood celebrities. Famed psychic Peter Herkos, after a visit to the Tate residence, claimed that three people, all of them homicidal maniacs under the influence of massive LSD doses, had committed the crime during a black magic ritual. Truman Compote, 
author of In Cold Blood, appeared on the Johnny Carson show to state that in all likelihood on the Tate murders had been committed by one man who had been triggered into a state of acute paranoia. By the end of September, authorities confessed they had little to go on. No connection between the Tate, Babayanka, and Hinman murders had been established. Odd, since the word pig or piggy had been written in blood at all three murder locations. Pig was the word Charlie had used to describe Stanley Barry when he told Crockett, the afternoon I left with Stanley for Las Vegas, I think I'll chop up that piggy and find a good hole to dump him in. Crockett ignored the remark and went about his business. Not realizing that slowly we were helping to push Charlie Manson to his karmic turning point. Near the end of September, Manson was making numerous forays into Death Valley, looking for caves, exploring the terrain, choosing strategic hideouts in which to store his burgeoning supplies. Still searching for the mystical hole in the desert where the family could go to wait out the ravages of Helter Skelter and make a new beginning. Traveling in caravans of three to five dune buggies, he led these expeditions for days at a time, leaving Clem and Bruce and a few girls behind to watch the Myers Ranch in his absence. At one point, Charlie asked me to search for the hole by diving with scuba gear into Devil's Hole, a vast, murky, water-filled cavern just across the Nevada border. Only months before, two professional divers had gone into Devil's Hole and had never come up. I said, no thanks. Still, I was playing both ends against the middle. I had accepted favors from the family, played music with them, made love to Snake, and at times had to listen to Charlie's Helter Skelter rap, still half believing it was true. I didn't want to do this. More, it was like an unconscious reflex born of habit. It was also, as Crockett said, foolish. A game I was playing that was rooted in conditioning and based in a part on my fear of completely severing ties with the family, and even after I sensed there was nothing left to salvage. Accepting this was to admit I had been a fool, a dupe, just another of Charlie's pawns, which I had. Describing my feelings is not easy, since they changed often, and there were many levels and much confusion. Inside, I told myself, they did not kill Shorty. I had seen him less than half a month before. I had waved, and he waved back. Charlie was merely trying to manipulate my fears. It was easy to say, yeah, we had to kill Shorty. But where was the proof? Charlie was always boasting of his macho exploits, but I had never actually seen him so much as step on a bug. Yet deeper down, I sensed it was true. I'd felt it. At that point, I still had no idea how deeply programmed I was, how much work it would take to free myself. Early one morning, sometime around the 1st of October, Charlie spotted me on the hillside and hiked up to where I stood, surveying the valley while sipping a cup of hot coffee. He reminded me that a year had passed since we had first come to the Barker Ranch as a family. He told me he was taking an expedition over to the Saline Valley and asked if I'd take the younger girls. Snake, Kitty... Weesh, Sherry, Barbara, and Patty, up to the Lotus Mine to hide out for a few days while he was gone. Charlie frequently moved his young loves to different locations, calling it survival training. 
Yet part of it, I knew, was his paranoia that, if left alone at the Myers Ranch, they would be vulnerable to outside influences. <laughs> you don't have to go all the way with them or nothing. Just show them how to get up there. That's a pretty tricky trail, you know. And they've never been up there. <laughs> I don't mind, Charlie, I said. An hour later, I met the girls at the head of Golder Wash, and we started for the Lotus, a defunct gold mine located about midway up Golder Canyon, at the top of the mountain, a strategic spot from which to survey the entire valley. The climb from the base of the wash to the mine and the small stone dwelling beside it followed a steep, twisting trail replete with switchbacks and spots where the footing was treacherous. Halfway up, Sherry and Barbara announced they had left their packs and canteens at the bottom of the trail and went back to get them, and I continued on to the mine with the girls. After helping them make camp, I hiked down the Cabrada and back four miles to the Barker Ranch. Later that afternoon, when Crockett, Brooks, and I went down to retrieve supplies from the foot of the wash, Sherry and Barbara Hoyt suddenly appeared from behind a rock, claiming they wanted to hike out of the valley and go back to L.A. We're afraid of Charlie, Barbara declared. Crockett listened while they confessed to their fears, his face expressionless his eyes scanning the alluvial fan that stretched 23 miles toward Ballarat. He reached over and felt the canteen Barbara had strapped to her waist. Getting dark, he said. Might as well go up with us. Think this out. That night, we sat around the table, drinking coffee and listening to Barbara and Sherry. Both girls were relative latecomers to the family. Barbara arriving at Gresham Street at a time when Helter Skelter was in its incipient stages. They had not been exposed to the in-depth indoctrination of some of the original girls, whose loyalty to Charlie was never in question. Barbara's voice was high-pitched and agitated. Charlie says we're free, that there are no rules, but we are not free. He says we could do what we want, but we can't. He said two weeks ago that if we tried to leave, he'd poke out our eyes with sticks. He, all we want is to go back to Ballarat, Sherry added. From there, we can get to L.A. After the girls had gone to sleep, I discussed it with Crockett and decided that I would take them to the base of the canyon drive down the gorge in the power wagon, and leave them at the edge of the valley. Give them enough water and tell them to keep a steady pace. They won't have no trouble. We'll feed them a good breakfast in the morning. At noon the next day, I dropped them off at the edge of the canyon, then headed back in the power wagon. I drove slowly, bouncing and weaving along the valley floor, avoiding eroded gullies and boulders. The sun blazed off the hood of the car, casting a blinding reflection. To cut the glare, I put on a pair of dark glasses that were lying on the dashboard. It was well over 120 degrees in the shade, the air bone dry. Sherry and Barbara would have to go slowly in the heat, but they had enough water and I knew from experience that, barring unforeseen circumstances, they would make it with little problem. I was nearing a point just south of Halfway House Spring, a particularly rocky stretch of ground almost directly beneath the lotus mine, when something distracted me. I looked to my left just as Charlie's head appeared above the rocks in the gully where he'd been, filling his canteen. At the very instant our eyes met, the left rear tire popped, the echo reverberating against the walls of the canyon. It was as if all the pressure generated by our gaze had caused the blowout. I sat stunned, 
listening to the hiss of escaping air as Charlie scrambled toward me over the rocks. He was shirtless and had Snake's binoculars around his neck. I knew at once he'd been watching me from the Lotus Mind. He had a shit-eating grin on his face as he approached me, dusting off his buckskins with his hands. He took off the hat he was wearing and held it as though appraising it, then looked at me. Thought you were heading out to Saline. Just wanted to check the girls, he said evenly. He leaned against the fender of the truck and put his hat back on. Hey, brother, he drawled. You wouldn't lie to me, would you? No. You wouldn't take Barbara and Sherry down the canyon, did ya? I looked Charlie dead in the eye. No. Charlie grinned. We both knew I lied, yet for some reason he reacted as though I had said yes. As though my lie had been programmed by him. That was Charlie's way. When things went against him, he often acted as though he had programmed it, so that no matter what was it said, he was in control. Well, he said, you want to drive me down there so we can pick them up? Got a flat. No jack. How about walking with me? I got to get back to the ranch, get this truck fixed. He gave me a long, hard look. Guess I'll have to get them myself. With that, he turned and trotted down the wash. Frightened and confused, I scrambled up the wash. Sherry and Barbara had a three-mile start on Charlie, but they didn't know he was after them. And we told them to conserve energy and go slow. Had the car been running, we'd have caught them in 20 minutes. I figured they had a 50-50 chance of making it. If he did catch them, I didn't know what he'd do. But it wouldn't be pleasant. For the first time, I was really scared. Up until then, my actions had all been open and above board insofar as Charlie was concerned. There was still the implication in the game we were playing that I might be won back to the fold, that Charlie might still invalidate Crockett. But helping his girls escape, I couldn't have crossed him in a more blatant fashion. I had an impulse to go back and find him. I felt like a condemned man, sensing that unless I confronted him right away, I'd never be able to face him. But I wanted to talk to Crockett. Now, thank you, right, Crockett said after listening to what had happened. Better go back and meet him. Tell him straight away. That lie put you on the run. And the longer you got it hanging over you, the more it's going to wear you down. I filled the canteen and put on my boots. Crockett went out on the porch with me. What you can do, he said, is process yourself on the way down there. So there's minimum tension when you meet him. You just imagine everything that could possibly happen when you see him. Everything. As vividly as you can. As many times as you can. All while you're walking. That way you run all the excess tension and energy off the actual confrontation. So it's cleaner. See what I'm driving at? Yeah, I see. It ain't like you imagine they're gonna happen. It's just taking the tension off the possibilities. Like making them pictures go away. So you don't bring them up when you get there. You just do it. I knew Charlie had eight or nine miles on me, but I took off anyway. It was dusk by the time I reached the base of the canyon and started out across the valley. I must have gone at least ten miles when I realized the futility of trying to catch Charlie at night.
I knew, too, that if I remained in the valley, he might not see me when he returned to Guler Canyon. It was bitter cold and pitch dark when I reached the base of the valley, wondering how I could ever stay warm through the night. Just moments later, I stumbled through a clump of brush, and my foot struck something soft. I reached down to find a sleeping bag. Brand new and still encased in a cellophane wrapper, probably dropped during one of the supply runs. It was uncanny, but no more freaky than the flat tire earlier that day. I was dumbfounded as I pondered the workings of fate while hiking back to the mouth of the wash. By then, I was totally exhausted. I laid my bag down in the middle of the trail, at a spot where Charlie could not help but see me, and despite my apprehension, fell asleep almost at once. <laughs> About mid-morning the next day, Tex, Bruce, and Brenda came bounding up the wash in a bright red Toyota. They stopped just five feet from me and honked, jolting me from sleep. They'd been staying at the hot springs. When I asked where Charlie was, they said he was behind them a few miles in another dune buggy. Are Sherry and Brenda with him? No. Why? Brenda asked. Just wondered. I got out of the sleeping bag and started rolling it up. You need a ride back up? Gotta talk to Charlie. For the next hour, I waited, still processing all the confrontation possibilities in my mind. I was apprehensive, but in control. It must have been close to noon when Charlie finally rumbled into view, about twenty yards from where I sat, hunched against the cool wall of the canyon. The moment he spotted me, he stopped the buggy and leaped out with a forty-five pistol in his hand. You motherfucker! He shouted. I should blow your head off. My heart was thudding, but I didn't panic. Charlie's eyes were bloodshot, his face windburned and dry. He pushed the barrel into my chest. You ready to die? He bellowed. I held my breath, but didn't flinch, then said, Sure, go ahead. I fucked up. Maybe I deserve it. I'd be doing you a favor. Maybe so. Then he thrust the gun at me and I took it. Maybe you ought to kill me. See what it's like. No, Charlie. You know I don't want to do that. How about if I just cut you a little? He pulled out his knife and shoved the point against my throat. I took a step back. Well, then you cut me. He offered me the knife, and I shook my head. You know what I ought to do? I ought to kill that fucking old man. He talked those girls into leaving. No, he didn't. All they wanted was food and water. They were leaving anyway. Well, he put discontent in their heads. Get in! Charlie pointed toward the dune buggy, and we both climbed in. He laid the forty-five in the back and fired up the engine. I caught up with those girls in Ballarat, he said, without looking at me. They wouldn't talk. I gave them twenty bucks and sent them back to Spawns. Moments later, Charlie was laughing. He put his arm around me. Nothing's changed, you know, between you and me. What goes around comes around. We're still brothers, and no redneck piggy miner is going to change that. Because one day, he's going to wake up and find that he just ain't here. Near the top of the canyon, we came up behind Juan and Brooks hiking toward the ranch. Charlie stopped, and they climbed in. Where you been, Juan? Seems like I hardly ever see you anymore. Juan didn't reply, but he held Charlie's gaze through a rearview mirror. 
Charlie pulled up at the gate and stopped. We all piled out. Say hello to that old man for me, he said. Then he lurched forward in a swirl of dust, and we headed into the yard as Crocker came down to meet us.